How's everybody doing tonight? Okay? On Thursday, we're doing a risk assessment. Uh, lab and specifically on passwords here on campus for your RBC Eagle online services uh, what else Gmail RBC Gmail which a lot of students still don't use their RBC Gmail for some reason but you do have that um, I put up here a map that was actually posted uh, a couple semesters ago this was on an open, I did an open Wi-Fi using a Wi-Fi app called uh, Wi-Fi Finder, I believe it is. Uh, on a, it was an iPad or iPhone app. And I, basically, I started over here by Riverside and uh, actually over here by Riverside. Riverside and uh, Alpine. And all these spots here that you find here are either web or open connections. Um, coming along the network driving at you know normal speeds uh, and this app actually shows you a pinpoint on the map you can actually click on it it'll show you the IP address and what security it has if any the other one I mentioned a couple weeks ago if you've not already downloaded on your laptop I do recommend for PCs anyway network stumbler network stumbler for PCs is a uh, good product to see what's around you. And if you do have GPS on your laptop, it does put the coordinates on the, on the Google map as you're driving around or walking around your neighborhood. And there are also other ones for all the phones, basically. Um, so I wanted to highlight that a little bit. We are in week nine, kind of looking ahead a little bit. This week we're gonna be doing uh, Threat agents, vulnerability assessments, there is careers in this. Oh, and before I forget, I did post on Facebook a new job posting. So if you want to go to myrbc.org, there is a new job posting for a full time, or take it back, it's only six hours a week, I think. Six hours a week, it's, it's a part time, local, and it's actually one of the RBC board members' company. And they need a PC repair person, just, you know, real quick not a lot of time involved with it but they need somebody that can be there five six hours a week something like that and so i'm guessing they would take care of you pretty well so being an rbc board member so if you are interested in that post it on that website that you're interested i'd like to get that filled in the next few days uh, the other ones that are on there are still in the process of doing interviews but if you are interested in any of them on that website post uh post your uh, resume and also go into my RBC and my future to tell tell us which one you're interested in. Okay, uh, so we're doing that this week. We have a chapter nine uh, quiz and review questions as always. Looking ahead, you got to here in a couple weeks. Ne next week is um, for our lab. We're doing TrueCrypt in week ten. And TrueCrypt, if you've not used that before, I know one person in here has. Uh, it actually will uh, encrypt volumes on your computer, either hard drives, network volumes, uh, USB drives. It'll not only encrypt them, but it'll hide them from view once it's unmounted. So you can literally put an entire volume on a network, use TrueCrypt to um, encrypt it, and then only users that have TrueCrypt on their machines or on their USB drives, that's how I use it, the TrueCrypt application can run off a USB drive, and then you can um, grab one file, basically, put a password in, and you can see an entire volume. Otherwise, you don't, people don't see it at all. So you can literally hide gigs of data or gigs of, of uh, content with TrueCrypt. You can also, with TrueCrypt, do a boot uh, cryptography, basically, which basically boots the, uh, encrypts the boot sector of the operating system, meaning you cannot even boot up unless you have the TrueCrypt password. So it encrypts the entire operating system and all the contents. Uh, governmental facilities use that. It is open source, so the website's already there. That's a fun one, week 10. Week 11, um, 
This week, you are working on your presentation. We're not having class uh, on, let's see, I think we're going to have class on Tuesday, not have class on Thursday that week. Yeah, I believe that's how we're going to do it. Uh, this one, if you do do review questions this week, it is extra credit. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint template in there. And next week, week 10, I'll actually go over some helps for you on your research paper presentation. And so week 11, we will be meeting that Tuesday, and that Thursday we will not be, be meeting. And you can use that time to work on your research paper presentation. That's week of 1029, just coming up right around the corner. Week 12 on basic cryptography, we'll be doing a lab using Kubuntu, virtual PC, uh, both. If you don't have virtual PC installed on your computer, it is a free program. You can download it and install it on any Windows operating system and install other virtual operating systems like Kubuntu, other Windows operating systems. Um, just install it virtually. It, it installs it to a one file application or one file uh, system. And if you've never used any virtual PC products, I'd recommend downloading that and playing with it. But we'll be installing Kubuntu, uh, Kubuntu using virtual PC on that week. 12. Week 13, um, Drive Look. It's a forensics application to look at the, it basically does a scan of an entire volume. In this lab, I think I just have you set up a small volume, scan it, and it looks up all the words in that volume. So even if, even if stuff's been deleted on a volume, it'll find it. Whether it be images, text, documents, doesn't matter. Unless a format has been done on that volume, it's going to find whatever's been on that volume since it, start, since it was be, began being used in that computer. It is a forensics tool um, and has the ability, again, to index the entire hard drive and then you keyword search it, like putting keywords like confidential, keyword, you know, document keywords that people aren't supposed to have on their hard drive could be put in there as well. It's also used, as you can guess, for uh, businesses use it to uh, find users that have pornography on their computer that try to hide it because it does it even if people delete caches on their Internet Explorer or Firefox it finds every trace that's ever been on that computer even internet caches that have been deleted so totally free software it's under a meg in size I believe it originally ran on a floppy disk and it still runs great and works so we'll be going now over that on week 13. Week 14 and 15, I believe, is your presentations. Yeah, on week 14, I have some out there still from last semester you can look at. Presentations that were done. If your last name begins A through N, you begin your, you'll be doing your presentation on week 14. And then everybody else on week 15. At the end of week 15, um, we will go over to the IT department here on campus and in, in, uh, right around the corner here and do a tour of the inside of the IT department. And the gentleman over there will give us a tour of um, how they do their monitoring, voice over IP, 3Com uh, that they use for voice over IP, and then all, all their servers where they're located, how their servers are set up over there. and so. That's always a good one. Also on week 15, I'll be bringing pizza that night. You guys bring everything else, except for alcohol. I can't bring that. But everything else you can bring. All right, so we're winding down, actually. It's week 9, but week thir week 14 will be here before you know it. Okay? So here in a couple weeks, uh, in fact, week 11, that, that Thursday, week 11, you'll have that whole session to work on your presentation and paper. Next week, I'll devote... Uh, probably next Tuesday to helping you with your research paper and presentation just to give you any pointers I can give you to get started to kind of narrow down your topics okay all right let's look at some vulnerability assessment there is um, in IT a component in IT called risk management that you can get a job in if you want to go down that route uh, it's basically on, for the most part, numbers and assessing uh, vulnerabilities within organizations, assessing 
how buildings can be penetrated, how networks can be penetrated, and then also uh, tools that can be used to uh, stop networks from being broken into. So risk management begins though with numbers, like what is the value of every single item on your network. And there's a program called spiceworks.com. I do recommend that is free to download. And I might have mentioned here, I know I have it on 10, it's more of a networking app, but spiceworks.com. You download it, install it on the server, you let it run. It does a full analysis of your environment. In fact, I think I might have it on this machine, maybe. Let me look here real quick and show it to you. It's a pretty cool app. Now, if you notice on mine, it's starting up with port 80, meaning it is a web server. It's its own web server once you start it up. And what it'll do is a basic management of your entire system. It begins doing an inventory of what it's doing right now. It's configuring system, my system here. Um, but it basically it is an inventory of everything on your network. So switches, hubs, computers, computers meaning iPads, uh, desktop, laptops, uh, mobile devices it'll grab all of it and then basically what you can do is go in there and then type in there the cost of that item attach a receipt or any type of uh, warranty to that item it also have its its own built-in help disk desk system built into this and it has you know tons of users on here hundreds and thousands of IT folks uh, it is ad driven, but it doesn't cost anything for you to use. They do have a pro version, and they really keep modifying and updating it over the years. I think I actually started using it uh, in a couple businesses here locally about four or five years ago. Because again, it helps what we're talking about this week because risk management, one of the first things you gotta do is inventory everything. And most, most of you will get jobs where you're basically maybe the only person maybe around here in the IT department initially or be very small IT department. To where software like this will really help you, um, you know, with your time, basically. It'll do a lot of the stuff that you wouldn't have to do manually, or you would normally have to do manually. And um, I'll let that run. While that, when that's finished running, we'll come back to it. But risk management is going over vulnerability of that, of that network, but first you gotta have some type of before you know what's vulnerable, you have to know what you've got, which I've already talked about and managing it. And then look at, we look at penetration testing as well. We've done a little bit of that already this semester. But risk management is one of the most important assets of organization because it protects data. And unfortunately, importance of data is generally underestimated. What I mean by data would be credit card information, personal information, um, Anything about your person that in the place you work at is your is data, or it could be corporate information, uh, company information, project information. But the first steps in data protection actually begin with understanding risk and the management of those risks. One of the things that IT folks tend, tend to, when you first start anyway, and even those have been in it for years, think that their system is un, unpenetrable. No one's gonna be able to get it. It's Fort Knox. That's cute. I dare you to come. I'm the big man on the mountain. I dare you to knock me down. <laughs> okay? That's like yeah, exactly. And that's far from the truth. Every system, every system, hit enough times by the right people and the right time and the right right uh, tools can uh, bring systems down. And not only that, every system has its risk. Every, every there's not a, it's not 100% foolproof regardless of what how how well you have a rule set up and security on doors set up and um, training of people you can do everything right you can do everything right and still they're going to be risks that's why we have insurance right that's why you drive your car tonight hopefully with insurance and you have to have at least liability um, and up to full coverage because there's always risk uh, in anything specifically in, even in networking. So what is risk? In information security, risk is the likelihood that a threat agent 
will exploit a vulnerability. A threat agent could be a malware, virus, a person stealing data, a person breaking a door down and stealing your servers, your overhead projectors, you name it, they can do it, um, and it's been done. Um, more generally, a risk can be defined as an event or condition that could occur. If it does occur, it could have a negative effect, and it would have some, now some of that negative effect can be minimal, some will be maximum effect. Risk generally denotes a potential negative impact to an asset. So realistically, risk cannot ever be entirely eliminated. It would cost too much or take too long to do that. Uh, rather, some degree of risk must be assumed. So that's why we have risk management. And in IT, you do have, if you just Google risk management or you know, risk assessment, networking risk management, you'll get a few jobs in the you know, tri-state area come up because that is a job title, uh, risk management, IT risk management. And it's basically a systematic approach to managing the potential for loss and the threats that come against your system or the threat agents. The first step, and I've already talked about this a little bit, is to determine what assets you have. No brainer there, right? But you know, when you first walk into an environment and you get a job, you don't know what's there, really. You don't really know what people have, what the company's bought, what they have in every room, what people have at home that's been bought. You know, so you have to identify all of the assets and inventory them. And, the first, and there's types of assets. You have data, hardware, personal assets, physical assets, and software. That's a lot of assets, OK? It's a lot of money. I mean, one of the biggest, if you're a lawyer, one of the biggest money-making um, areas to go into is risk management, you know? Because you basically have, it's, the numbers can be whatever you want it to be you know, whatever you design it to be. Because you're talking about a person's life. How much, is, how much is your life worth, how much is your life worth, basically, is, is what we're talking about. And in courts, that, it's very subjective. And so when you're talking about risk management, one of the lists in here is personal. You, as an employer, uh, and hiring employees, have to have this in there. Data, hardware, personal, or physical, and software, I think is the cheapest data. It's the cheapest assets, actually, in all the mix here. Personal assets is the most expensive, meaning are we protecting the data and the people in our business? The data that people have and the people that work for our business, are they being protected in all areas? So these are the type of assets you could you know, categorize everything as. Along with the assets, the attributes of the assets need to be compiled, like um, the, the value of each one of them. Now again, in this, in, this, uh, in this scenario, you can determine what a person's value is by a couple of factors in a business. What would that be, you think? A person's job, what is it? How, you, how can you assess a person's value in a year how, how would be the easiest way you could think of off the top of your head? Their performance rating. Do what now? How quickly you'd be able to replace them with the experience and expertise that that particular person has. You want to replace somebody in who could come in and literally do everything the other person was doing without a hitch at all. Right, so it'd be what? That person's a salary for that position, right? Plus the training and whatever else is involved in HR and all that good stuff. So it's not going to be just that person's salary or that position's salary, it'll be, like you mentioned, training, uh, recruitment, headhunters, whatever it is you have to do to get new, you know, the whole gamma. Uh, so, you know, if a person makes 60, say, that, say the position is $65,000. Let's say that's the position base salary, $65,000. You can probably double that is what I would do and what I have done. Double that, that's the cost for that position, 120000 120000 because that includes not just that person position, all the supported positions that help that person get hired, trained, all that good stuff, uh, benefits. So 120,000, just double it. So factors that should be considered in determining the value, how critical is that asset and the goal of the organization, what, how difficult would it be to replace that asset. And remember what we're talking about here is not just people, but it is people as well, but it could be you know, servers, switches, computers, hubs, iPads, iPhones, you name it, whatever devices you use, printers. How much does it cost to protect it? 
how much revenue does it generate, okay? That last one, again, is subjective, but some things are not subjective, meaning if it's a sales position or if it's a piece of hardware that collects money from people in a business, that's a no-brainer to figure out how much money generates, how much that person generates, or how much that equipment generates. But if it's a supportive position, sometimes supportive positions or support, supportive hardware is hard to put a dollar sign on. So a lot of these you will have to guess a little bit, guess best guess value type thing. And by the way, there are there are softwares that does all of this for you, basically, and you just plug in the data. So here is some uh, screenshot of some software attributions. So you've got the attribute of hardware and software here, the attribute equipment name, equipment type, manufacturer. Ma model part number, serial number, inventory tag, software and version number, location, where's that, address, the IP and MAC address, the unit, the organizational unit where it's found out in the organization, is it in marketing, is it in sales, is it in HR, is it in whatever, maintenance. And those of you maybe taking networking already, when an organizational unit is a, again, a uh, structure in networking that you design before you begin to build your network. You decide, okay, I've got the top root of my organization, Microsoft, and then all the subsidiary departments are the organizational unit or units of my business. And then the function, what does that asset do? So this would be a, you know, a, uh, could be a spreadsheet you put all, all this information in, or software like Spiceworks. Factors that consider determining the value, how quickly it can be replaced, what's the cost to replace it, what impact of organization is going to have it's unavailable. What security implications if the asset's unavailable? Let's talk quickly. We're actually doing this Thursday. Okay, let's talk about passwords for just a second. Or accounts. Go more general. People's accounts at work. Okay, your personal account. How important is that for that to be secure to you? Let's talk about banking. You're in banking and you have account access to multiple different things in your job. How important is that password, username, password to you, you think? Or how important should it be to the company that is secure? Pretty secure, pretty important, you think? Yeah, it's important as your job, right? Because if, if, if you give me your password and say, hey, I'm going to go lunch, but you can go ahead and go in and do this for me, that's not a good thing, okay? But it happens, okay? But not only that, let's say her password gets stolen or somebody hacks into it. Um, you know, those are all things that, and, and maybe brings down a database, deletes a database. How could that impact the organization if somebody wiped out an entire database of banking checking accounts in one day? They wiped them out completely, just wiped them out, deleted them all. How long would it take to come back up? Do, how long would it take the backups to be restored to come back up into the system? That's, that's the easy part. The hard part is, okay, what, if, what could you people do with that information? Okay, all the data that's in there that they took maybe before they deleted it, what could they do with that information? Could, is that gonna impact a banking organization? Yeah, it's gonna impact a banking organization big time. Um, what security implications uh, if this asset's unavailable? Like, for instance, databases I mentioned for, the, for a banking facility. Next is to identify the threat. The threat is, determines the threat from the threat agents. A threat agent is any person or thing or power with the power to carry out a threat against an asset. And that could be a hacker, that could be a malware virus, it could be a burglar breaking into the building, um, you name it. And what they do is they have what's called threat modeling. And threat modeling constructs a scenario of types of threats that can, an asset can face. It helps to understand who the attackers are, why they attack, and what type of attacks might occur. So here's some examples of categories of threats and their example of where they could come from. Like a natural disaster, fire, flood, earthquake, compromise of intellectual property, software piracy, espionage, a spy steals production schedule, Extortion, a mail clerk is blackmailed into intercepting letters, 
Hardware failure, errors, a network intrusion prevention system blocks all network traffic. Human error, employee drops a laptop in a parking lot. Sabotage or vandalism, an attacker implants worm that erases files. Software attacks, virus worm denial of service. Software failure errors, a bug prevents the program from properly loading. Technical obsolescence, uh, program does not function under new version of operating system. Theft, a desktop system is stolen from an unlocked room. And utility interruption, electrical power is cut. Now all of these happen all the time in businesses. Um, some more than others. Some of these categories happen more than others. So you, what you do is you develop from your list of things that could happen an attack tree one by one. You, pro you provide a visual of the attacks, how they can occur to an asset. So here's a simple one, an attack tree of stealing a car stereo. You have different levels here. You've got the level one, level two, level three, and level four. Okay, let's start at the bottom with level four. Some ways this can, can happen, a car stereo be stolen. Threaten the attendant, blackmail the attendant, or bribe the attendant to give you a copy of uh, a key to get into the car to steal the stereo. Or level three, grab a purse that has a key in it to get into the stereo. Level two, break the glass of the car, carjack the car to get the stereo. Okay, all different ways to get a car stereo out of a car. All right, and there's probably others, but this is just one example of an attack tree, and you could put at the top anything you want it to be. It could be a database. Level four. How can a person get into a database? Okay, I don't know. Find a password on somebody's keyboard, number one. Another level, level four might be uh, bribe somebody to give them the password. You no, know, that might be hack, hack the system to get the password. So you can see where it can go from there. And so you make an attack tree to how the, how the assessment or how the asset can be attacked. Then, this one actually talks about a database like we just mentioned. So here we have level three. This has only three levels. The, f the third level is watch over somebody's shoulder for the password. Look under a mouse pad for a password. We all know that's, that happens. Level two, use an unattended computer. Locate a rogue access point. Then we've talked about that. Employees bringing in rogue access points into the business that anybody can access and get into the network if they connect to that access point. Like I can plug in an access point in, in this room, have it unprotected to get in, and anyone that can get into this access point can then get into RBC's network and begin looking at stuff, okay, and seeing what they can see. Um, because if you think about it, if I plug in my access point into this room, into the data port that my computer's on and your computer's on, that's totally different than an access point in the, the RBC access point that we see or the student access point. Because those systems, by the way, are totally off of the network grid, meaning you're not gonna, you're not gonna get with that, uh, with some of these access points, like the guest one, you're only gonna get internet access. Even if the, someone wants to hack into a, you know, a, guest, a guest access point, they're only gonna get internet access. But if they go into an open, rogue access point in somebody's office that's connected to the internal network, that could be some problems. They can go in and see pretty much anything as you're seeing it on your computer. Um, so the final result in this is to access a research folder maybe that has a development database in it, like an R&D database of all the new products. They right click, save as, and put it on a USB thumb drive. Done, in and out in five minutes. Now is it as easy as that? No, probably not, but with all the people that bring in, not just rogue access points, but look at the level three. Forget the rogue access point, you know, just watch over somebody's shoulder or look at the mouse pad or go to a public computer in that area that's open to get, to get or, you know, we talked about asking somebody that's a, you say you're a visitor and you, you need access to something and you're in a meeting really quick you forgot a file on your computer, would it be okay if you borrowed their computer to get into your system? Awkward pause, the person goes, 
yeah, I got to go to the restroom anyway, so here you go. Does it happen? Oh, yeah, definitely. So you don't even really need to be a hacker to get into the system. In fact, even if they lock their computer and go to the restroom if they're in a public area, um, we had an issue in high school where somebody popped a key logger between the keyboard and the computer. And oh, yeah. And but again, it was, on a, it was an unattended computer, though, right? <laughs> it was an unattended yeah, computer. Right. Yeah. So then once you get the vulnerabilities, you appraise those vulnerabilities, take a snapshot of the security organization as it stands now. And generally what we're talking about here is you usually have someone from the outside do this whole appraisal thing. And why do you think that's important to have somebody from the outside do this? Why do you think that's important to do that? Are you going to be biased a little bit of your network? Probably. I know I am, probably. Right? So... You're going to be a little defensive, a little like, well, you know, you know, this isn't such a big deal. everything works fine. I don't know what you're talking about, you know, but we all know that it's, you know, we can be biased. So bringing outside folks to come in can give us a more valid assessment. They're going to have the bias that we have. And then every asset must be viewed in the light of the threat. Uh, determining vulnerabilities often depends upon the background experience of the assessor. And that's why it's good to bring someone from the outside a lot of times to do this initial, initial assessment. Now you as an IT person can come in and follow up on that assessment to make sure you're loop, you know, closing all the loopholes maybe that are in there. And then risk assessment basically involves determining the damage that would result from an attack, whether it be database stolen, um, you know, server stolen, malware coming into your network, power outage, whatever it might be and the likelihood that vulnerability is a risk to that organization. And what they do with risk assessment is they put a percentage on it. Within a year's time, what's the percentage of a tornado wiping out your building? It might be 10%, whatever. What about fire? Again, maybe five, 10%. What about somebody coming in and stealing data from your organization? That might creep up a little higher, it might be 50, 60, 70%, whatever. And here's the reasons why and how they can get in. And, and a lot of times it's not how are we going to stop it. A lot of times it's just knowing how it can happen to where, and we'll find out in a second, not only that you assess the risk, but there's a recovery plan in place, right? Sometimes you can't do anything about it, but having a plan is good. Having a, having a plan if something does happen is the reason for all this. And some of the ways that things impact us, vulnerabilities impact us, there's no impact whatsoever, okay? No impact whatsoever. Uh, the vulnerability would not affect the organization. For example, theft of a mouse on a person's computer hopefully will not shut the whole place down and send everybody home. <laughs> okay? If that's the case, that's, yeah, 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 that's, somebody's looking for a day off for sure if that's the case. Small impact uh, could be in this example here, a network interface adapter card fails, might require that a spare card be made available and that all cards be peri periodically tested. A significant impact. This would be a uh, loss of employee productivity due to downtime. Malware is injected into the network, could be classified as a significant vulnerability. Major one, those that have considerable negative impact, like a theft of the latest product research and development database through a back door, could be considered a major vulnerability. And then cat catastrophic, and this one could be a tornado, fire, whatever, natural disaster, destroying the company's um, building and all the, all the data in the company. So calculating the anticipated risk and losses can be helpful in determining the vulnerability. There's two formulas that uh, folks use that are in this um, line of business actually. is One is single loss and then the other is annualized loss. The single loss is the expected monetary loss every time this could occur. How much money would it take to bring things back up to where it should be? Annualized loss, the expected monetary value that can be expected for an asset due to a risk over a period of time. Okay, so for instance, talking about you know theft, uh, stores have the bottom one all the time. How much theft are we going to have this year? It's not you know, will we have? It's we are going to have theft. So how much are we going to have? What's the dollar amount? And they assess that, like grocery stores, retail stores, things of that nature. For IT, it could be 
you know, how many people walk off with mouse, with mouse pads, I don't know, mice, keyboards, you know, whatever you name it, you know, people walk off with. Then you got risk mitigation, which is the final step to determine what to do about the risk. Options, now here's, here's a kicker here, and we're going to do this Thursday, you're going to start doing this Thursday anyway with your take home. Options when confronted with the risk, you either diminish it, transfer it, or accept it. So you do something about it and diminish it by maybe adding more security, more training, more hardware, software, right? whatever it is you need to do. You transfer the risk, meaning we're going to bring this off onto another time or another department, or we're going to basically eat the risk. We're not going to really do anything about it. And then accept the risk, uh, is accepting the risk that it's going to happen. Not, we're not going to ever do anything about it. Um, so those are the three options, diminishing, transferring, accepting it. So here's the steps again. The first step is, is asset identification. I inventory the step, the assets, record them, determine their value. The second is threat identification, classify threats by category, design an attack tree. And generally these attack trees are designed for large things, for the large items, not the small items, but the large items like the company database, the R&D database, um, your computers on system, on site, things like that, that, if it could be stolen. So you don't do everything a, a tree, but the big things you do a, a tax tree. Then vulnerability appraisal, determine current weaknesses in your asset, and this is where it helps other people come in. This is where you're gonna be biased. We have no weaknesses. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Saying you don't have a weakness is a weakness, <laughs> okay? Uh, so you got to come bring somebody in to say, okay, your weakness is you maybe, I don't know, aren't strict enough on people sharing passwords. I noticed during my risk assessment analysis, this is what the person putting this together could say in their paper, that Joe over here in this department was sharing, shared his password with all of his employees so they could get into whatever system every day. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, exactly, not anymore. <laughs> that could be a weakness, all right? Um, could be door access weakness, uh, people's letting each other use their uh, proximity cards to get into doors, whatever. People are propping the door open at lunchtime just in case somebody's late. The person, people coming in, won't be docked the time because they use a proximity card again. I mean, you can name it, you go know, list goes on and on of things that people do. So you have to have some type of weakness, determining the weaknesses, and then vulnerability scanners or hardware software uh, like we're using here, the running here right now tonight, the Spiceworks. And then risk assessment is the fourth one. Est uh, estimate impact of vulnerability, calculate the loss, estimate probability, the vulnerability will occur. So you've got asset identification so far, threat identification, vulnerability appraisal, risk assessment number four, and then finally risk mitigation. Decide what to do with the risk. Diminish it, transfer it, or accept it, okay? So identifying the vulnerabilities through the appraisal determines the current weaknesses of our organization. Two categories of software and hardware tools you, you can find free. One of them I just brought on the board, Spiceworks is a good one for vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. Penetration testing could be um, any number of things. We like the Kane Enable software we've used in here. You can use that for penetration testing of your network to see what people can get in, see what you can get into, see what you can find that's out there. Um, I'll remember when we did that lab, we, when we set it to art poisoning, how the passwords just started coming through and seeing them visually uh, on your system could mean, eh, maybe people can start having harder passwords than dog, cat, Larry, and Sue. <laughs> okay, might need some training on that, okay? Um, penetration testing goes further. Uh, is there any rogue access points around your network? If there are, let's find out where they're at. Educate people that you're definitely not supposed to bring them. Put some type of rules in place if, the, if they're found to bring them. There is no warning, this is your warning. If we're found, you're fired, whatever. That's pretty, to the point, but you've got to put it like that, otherwise people will. Human nature is, fine. they want a line, people want a line, if you don't give them a line, then they're just gonna keep going. 
vulnerability scanning is typical and when we do the IT tour here uh, at the end of the semester, they have a number of them that they run out. One is Nmap. Nmap's a popular one. I'll write up on the board. We have Nmap, I believe, on most of these computers here. Uh, Wireshark. These are all open source vulnerability tools. Password crackers would be um, can enable would be a good one for that one. And so you use these tools to determine what vulnerabilities you have. IP scanners to determine um, if all your IPs are unique on a network. Port numbers, you might have port numbers that are open, you don't need open, like say FTP port F21 is open, you don't need it. And by the way, port 21 is an unsecured port and people can do pretty much whatever they want to. So if that is open on a server, that's not a good thing. People can get in there and get data. So well-known uh, port numbers that people, that networks have, um, 0 to 1023 reserved for most universal applications. Example, port 25 for SMTP, that's going to be open. Uh, register port numbers 1024 through 49,151. Other ap applications that are not as widely used use this, like a calendar access protocol, Microsoft Access uh, Calendar, or Microsoft Calendar, I'm sorry. Groupwise Calendar is another one. Uh, let's see. Apple's Calendar, iCal, uses uh, those port ranges, 01126. 1026 port for that. Private port numbers, uh, the 49,000 number through the 65,000. This is used for private apps in particular organizations. And this is reserved for any private, organ private application that people have developed or you've bought third party. And so a lot of organizations will only open ports or keep ports open that they know their applications use and close all other ports. Make sense? So if you have no private port numbers or very few, you find out what those port numbers are, you open those ports, every other port shut down. Can't get into it, can't access it. If an attacker knows what port to use, that port can be probed for a weakness, like port 21 I mentioned, and then they can throw on their port scanner to determine port vulnerabilities. Kane Enable has one of those port scanners. And it can also determine the state of the port if things are running well. And you've got three states on a port. You have open, closed, and blocked. That's it. And with a software like um, Nmap, and I, Wireshark even lets you see ports as well, you can determine if ports are open. And then they can begin to see if they can use those ports to get data. Here's another example of a software called RAdmin. You put in the IP ranges that you want to scan, and then notice it gives you all the open ports, closed ports available. Like in this bottom example of 192.168.0.6, has five open ports, port 21, 25, and 110. is just three of them it shows. Okay, network mappers, I've already talked about one. One I recommend is Nmap is an example of an app that you can download. Doesn't cost anything. Um, let me see if I have this one online. Yeah, I do. Here's Nmap. And my, you guys might have these on your computers. I think you should. I don't know. So here's Nmap. And then basically what I can do with Nmap is I can come in here and put an IP range of my area. And then I can begin to scan that range. Once I start scanning that range, you'll notice how it begins to find data, gives me output, and then I can begin looking at topologies, how it's ran. Let me go to, uh, yeah, it's going now. So here it's finding for IP address ending in dot three, dot four, dot five, dot eight. Says host is down. As it goes through your guys' ports, it'll start opening them up, if you can notice there. It starts seeing some ports open now. 
then I should be able to go over here to uh, cancel it so we can see what's going on here. Let's go with uh, quick scan, be quicker. And this is going to give me vulnerabilities on open ports. Uh, I can find up there what applications are running. Still running here. And I can get, you know, a ping, a trace route, quick scan like I'm doing now. It shouldn't take as long. Here you go. So here's one for dot seven. It has open port 139 and 445. I can start taking and grabbing those ports and seeing if what I can get in those machines just by finding out what ports are open. Okay, let's see if I can get into this baby here real quick. And then we'll end on this if I can log into this. Okay, this is Spiceworks. We'll spend a few minutes on this, and then we'll be done. And, then, and by the way, you guys can download this at home and play with it on your home network, uh, like I'm doing here. On the inventory part, notice you've got an inventory tab. It's got a help desk tab. Community tab is where you can find help from other users. Purchasing, uh, you can actually find in uh, purchasing list of things you purchased and attached. Uh, Receipts, um, you can attach warranties to that. But let's see here if we've got an inventory of any type coming in. Yeah, cool. All right, so let's go to this one right here. It's got 21 items it's inventoried. Okay, here's a printer. In fact, it's the one here in this room. It tells me exactly when I highlight it, the IP address, the vendor, serial number. I can double click on this, asset, and then I can go in here and I can add in notes. It could be a, a receipt I could add in here. Uh, documents, I could upload a PDF file. It gives me the configuration. It tells me right now the toner cartridge. Um, and shop for supplies right within here. I can click this button, it'll actually let me go out and buy supplies for that. And so this scanned everything um, on this network since it's been installed on this. And if I go to like, say for instance, the dot one, which is a server, the Cisco server, notice it says it's a Cisco network device. Gives me the MAC address of that server, serial number of that server. Last time it was updated. And then again, I can add in notes as, as well into that, into that uh, device. Pretty cool, right? And this, is, this scans your network within you know, a 12 hour period, depending on how, what size your network is. And then you can go in there and add, like I said earlier, you can add in your notes, which I, the way I've used it is you can actually double click on these uh, tabs these edit tabs and I can go in here and say okay what is this device type it's a uh, you know desktop um, oh I can put in here the owner information the purchase price what I paid for it uh, purchase date can be put in here as well the model asset tag from the or from the RBC organization location where it's found WC220 product number, if any, and then save it, and that data is updated for that machine. So you, it scans the majority of the information, puts it in, then you just have to edit it. So that's the uh, inventory.
and you notice it pushed one of mine over into workstation because I relabeled it to a PC. But notice it has workstation, servers, printers, networking devices like routers, switches, hubs, other devices like maybe IP, um, IP enabled, overhead projectors, unknowns, phones. So if we go to the help desk area, this one actually you can take and set up help desk to where it basically is a shortcut on the user's desktop. And when they click on the icon, this comes up. And then they can type in, I can type in, assign people, I can sign everybody in here as a user and say, okay, you're going to help so and so, here's the summary and here's the description. I put a priority and say hi, due date, category. I browse out and find a screenshot I took and save it and it's going to go directly to you, the technician, and you're going to know exactly what PC it was, what the problem was, and then you can go in and close it, put notes in it, all that good stuff. So this is a built-in help desk system. They also have a, um, within this system, they have a way to go in here, like I said earlier, and you can optimize it with the settings. You can tell it, um, you know, set it up however you want it to do, how, however you want it to work. You can actually set up the, I believe it's the, uh, let's see here where it was. Yeah, help desk settings. Yeah, here's where you set up the help desk settings, and then you know you can put it on a shortcut of the user's desktop, and then they can. Uh, here's a template. Here's a template you you can actually edit right here. Yeah, it's just basic HTML template. You can edit how you want the user to see that template. and then test it before you roll it out. And so that's spiceworks.com. Totally free, uh, open source, and it is ad-driven, but what's cool about it is if you have, once it does your inventory, you can attach to it, it has a built-in VNC too, by the way, I didn't show you, that basically if all the machines have VNC installed um, on the machine, you just click on the machine and it'll actually remote control it from Spiceworks. And so I can actually come in here and go into inventory, go to a workstation once I've tagged them all, and then right click on a workstation to remote it. Like this one actually gives me uh, recommendations for it what to do if I have a problem. It says here, should I upgrade to Windows 7? <laughs> okay, so pretty sweet. Um, again, this has to do with what we're talking about this week, which is asset management, which you've got to use something like this in your organization to figure out. It can be as simple as a spreadsheet to have everything in here like this does, or use this type of software that does a lot of the work on the front end, and then you just go in and tweak like I just said earlier, uh, the details of each machine, maybe price tag, any warranty that might be on it. Uh, but it does basic, basic maintenance management right here within Spiceworks. Like updates you can push out from this to that machine. Uh, you can push out their uh, remote control, help desk ticket system, all built in Spiceworks. So, all right. Thursday, we're going to be doing risk assessment. Be thinking about this on Thursday, which is taking the RBC passwords and we're going to, let me go to it real quick. We're going to look at the four steps that we should take on risk assessment, which are identify the assets and their attributes, determine what threat agents exist against that asset, determine what vulnerabilities exist, make decisions. The scenario is this for Thursday. We'll talk more about it. The RBC account password policy. When a person registered RBC, they are given an account for RBC Eagle, Q4 
communi email communication and online services, right? Whether they know it or not, they're given that. The questions we're going to ask ourselves is, is this policy secure? How can this account policy be exploited? Do students know how to change passwords in general? No. <laughs> Hallelujah, no over there. Uh, do students know how, what a secure password is? No. So what you guys are going to do is tackle the below steps on Thursday, and you'll have a you know, week to do this, basically. But you'll tackle the below steps of inventory the assets and attributes for an account passwords, determine what threat agents exist against account passwords, determine vulnerabilities, and then make decisions on what could be done to make this a more secure area, or are we just going to eat it and accept it and not change anything? Okay, so that's, this, that's the discussion we're going to have on Thursday. So you guys always give good examples and good suggestions, definitely. So, all right, so that's what we're doing on Thursday. So that's all I've got. Any questions? All right, we'll see everybody Thursday then. Good job.